I love Parkway. Amanda, Zoe, and I are staying safe, and we hope you guys are too. We can't wait to see you on Sunday. Hey, Zoe, do you want to tell everybody some things you've gotten to do at home? Uh-huh. Um, so we have been playing um, a lot of stuff. Um, we have had a great time here. Um, we have just missed you and um, a great time here. Um, we have um, been watching shows and movies, and um, we have just had a great time here. We have had playing games. We are playing dress up, a lot of stuff, and we are playing tent today and Toy Story. We have had a lot of fun getting to play things together and have some extra family time, but like many of you, there's also been a lot of challenges. We have family and friends that we miss terribly and can't wait to be able to be with again. So whether this week has been a great one for you or has been especially challenging, we're so glad that you have chosen to join with Parkway this morning to worship, and we're thankful for this opportunity for our family to worship with yours.
We're glad you've joined us today at Parkway for worship, and we hope that you have, a, have had a great week and look forward to having another great week as well. In our scripture today, Psalm 55, 22, it says, Cast your cares on the Lord, for he will sustain you. As we sing this next hymn, I hope that you'll remember all the ways that God has been faithful to you this week. We are missing every one of you and hope that uh, we'll have a time that we'll be able to be back together again. I am going to read to you this morning a scripture I came across this uh, during this time that we've been at home that really spoke to me. It's Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will it cease from yielding fruit. I felt like this just really spoke uh, to me because as I get older, I realize how little I have in the way of control in my life. And uh, no matter what, God is with me and he walks beside me. During, good morning, uh, Parkway family. During these particularly hard times, we must have unbridled trust in the one who is really in control. We are not in control of disease, the financial markets, taxes, anything. We are finding out the hard way how little we really are in control of. The Lord has given each of us a mind and he expects us to use wise, to make wise and informed decisions throughout our lives, but there's still much we do not control. We are reminded in the word to trust. 
Psalms 112.7 says, The righteous will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Can I get an amen that we've been receiving more bad news in the last five to six weeks than we have good news? Never has there been a louder wake-up call in, our, in recent years. Uh, we must trust in the one that has our back. I trust, uh, I trust in the Lord more to navigate the waters ahead than I do my own judgment. And uh, I know you probably feel the same way. Also, in Joshua 1, nine it says, This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. It's a command and a promise, all in one verse. And then you've been hearing all these commercials saying, You are not alone. Well, of course, we already know that. As we wrap up, we are reminded in Scripture of the importance of fellowship. We are each other's support in times of need. We are accountability partners, and we drive strength and encouragement for one another. We really do miss you guys. Lastly, no matter the distractions of these times, there's still an urgency to the message of the gospel. We are reminded in John 9, 4, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. We are his ambassadors through good and bad times, and the message has been, is, and always will be the same. Good news. We have until the trumpet sounds to get the message out about the hope we have in Christ Jesus. Have a blessed rest of the day. Let's close with a prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are truly grateful. Uh, we're grateful for the beautiful day uh, that we're having here today. At the same time, we're grateful for the times that we time now that we have in quiet uh, with one another, you know, with our families, to be able to pause and reflect and listen for your voice. Lord, we just uh, pray that soon we will be able to rejoin uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ in fellowship with one another. And uh, until that day, Lord, we just trust in you. We thank you for all that you do for us, and most importantly, we thank you for Jesus, for it's in his name that I pray. Amen. Amen.
What does it mean to be blessed? To live a truly happy, joyful, satisfied life. Well, Jesus shows us the way to just such a life in the opening statements of the greatest sermon that he ever preached. We know it as the Sermon on the Mount. We call these opening statements in the Sermon on the Mount the Beatitudes. Each one of them begins with the word blessed or makarios in Greek, which means supreme happiness and blessedness. In these verses, Jesus shows us the path to a truly blessed life. Today we're going to look at the first of these Beatitudes, which serves as the foundation for all the rest. It's found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, and I hope you have a Bible uh, nearby and handy. And as we look at this verse this morning, I'm going to ask you to do what I would ask you to do if you were here present with us in this sanctuary, and that is for just a moment, stand up wherever you are, as we honor the reading of God's Word. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, we read these words. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Would you say that with me out loud wherever you are? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is God's Word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, most importantly, live it out in your life. Now you may be seated. When I was in college back in the early 70s, one of the greatest political scandals to ever hit our country took place. We know it as Watergate. A scandal that would see dozens of political figures convicted and imprisoned for their crimes and a scandal that would ultimately lead to the President of the United States, Richard Nixon, having to resign from office in disgrace. One of the principal figures in the Watergate scandal was a man by the name of Charles Colson. Time Magazine described Colson as tough, wily, nasty, tenaciously loyal to Richard Nixon. He was known as the White House hatchet man, a man who was feared by the most powerful movers and shakers in Washington during his four years of service for President Nixon. The extent of Colson's religious life at that time simply uh, had its uh, genesis in the fact that his name was on a church roll at an Episcopalian church, a church to which he rarely went. But during Watergate, Colson's world was literally turned upside down. He resigned his role as the special counsel to President Nixon, and he reentered his law practice before the trials began. It was during this time that he was reacquainted with Tom Phillips, the president of Raytheon Company, a large electronics manufacturer that was the, the biggest employer in New England. Something had happened to Tom Phillips since he had last met with Charles Colson, and he wanted to tell Colson about it. And so one time when Colson was on his way to a vacation, he decided to drive by the Phillips home so he could sit down and talk with Tom and about what had happened in his life. When he arrived, Tom shared with him how he had committed his life to faith in Jesus Christ, and he challenged Colson to do the same. In his book, Born Again, Charles Colson describes the night he had this conversation with Tom Phillips. He writes, I knew that Tom had become a Christian, and he seemed different. I wanted to ask him to hear firsthand what had happened. Tom recounted to me that even though he seemed to have it all on the outside when it came to his family and career and possessions, there was a big hole in his life on the inside. Tom shared how he was in New York on business and noticed that Billy Graham was having a crusade at Madison Square Garden. He decided to go to the service, and at that service, 
he found what he was what was missing in his life a personal relationship to God in humility he asked God to forgive him of his sins and asked Jesus to come into his life and he said his emptiness was immediately filled with the presence and peace and power of Christ in his life that night Tom read to Colson parts of the first chapter of C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, which focuses on the great sin of pride. Colson says he was right on target because the pride that I possessed was causing my world literally, literally to collapse around me. As Tom was telling me about Jesus, I listened attentively, and I told him that he had definitely shaken me up, but I wasn't anywhere near ready to make that commitment in my life. I told him I had to be certain. I had to learn a lot more. I had to have all my reservations be satisfied. Tom said he understood, and then he offered to pray. And when Tom prayed, it was like unlike any prayer I'd ever heard before. It was as if Tom was speaking directly and personally to God. It was as if God were right there in the room with us. I was overwhelmed. When I got in my car that night to leave his house, I tried to drive out of his driveway, but I couldn't. Here I was, an ex-Marine captain and a White House tough guy, and yet I was sitting in the front seat of my car crying like a child. So I called out to God as best I knew how. I didn't know what to say. I just knew that I needed Jesus in my life. I said, God, I'm not much in the way I am now, but somehow at this moment, I want to give myself to you. Colson says, I didn't know what else to say, so I just repeated over and over again, take me, take me, take me. Well, we all know that God did take Charles Colson as he was born again that evening and Colson went on even with all his failures in the Watergate scandal to become a dynamic follower of Jesus Christ impacting millions of people around the world for God the point I wanted to make in recounting that story to you is that Colson's life began to turn around when he got to the very end of his rope and that's what Jesus is talking about in this first beatitude. In fact, the message translates the verse this way. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope because with less of you, there is more of God and his rule in your life. Surprising, isn't it, that happiness begins not when we believe in ourselves, not when we admire ourselves, not when we look to ourselves, but happiness begins when we recognize that we are weak and helpless and hopeless to make it on our own. The world says that Christianity is a crutch for weak people who can't make it on their own. And you might be asking, is that really true? And I would say to you, it is absolutely true. That is exactly what Christianity is. It is for weak people who can't make it on their own, but realize they have no place to go other than to God. And that's what this first beatitude is all about. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Being poor in spirit, I believe, involves five things that I want to share with you quickly this morning. First of all, being poor in spirit involves a correct understanding. Throughout history, people have misunderstood and misinterpreted what Jesus means here when he talks about being poor in spirit. He is not referring to material poverty. He is not speaking about false humility or or having an inferiority complex. It's not the idea that we're supposed to sit back and say, oh, I'm just a poor, pitiful, little old soul. No, the term poor in spirit means to be spiritually bankrupt. 
The word poor there in the Greek is the word tokos, which means to shrink or to cower or to cringe, much like a beggar would be seen doing in Jesus' day. There's a story in Luke 16 that graphically uses and illustrates uh, this word for us. In Luke 16, verses 19 through 21, the Bible says there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat from the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. This beggar was tokos. He was poor. He had nothing at all. He was helpless. He was uh, sick and starving. He didn't even have the energy to keep the dogs away from him who came and licked his sores. He begged not for the leftovers from the rich man's table. He, he begged from the crumbs that would fall from the rich man's table. He is not just poor. He is begging poor. Totally dependent on someone else in order to survive. That's the kind of poor Jesus is talking about here. Not physically, not poor on the outside, but spiritually poor on the inside. Blessed, happy is the person who begs inwardly for the Spirit of God in their life. To be poor in spirit means to Come to the complete end of yourself, to have exhausted all other resources, to completely empty yourself of any self-sufficiency or self-confidence or self-reliance, to be at the end of your rope. Because you see, it is only when we get to that place in our lives where we are finally reaching the end of ourselves, when we have no place else to turn, when we realize that we cannot do it on our own, it is at that point and at that place that God does his most profound and powerful work in our lives by blessing us with the power of his kingdom. Now, I want to warn you, that's not the message of the world we live in today. The world says, assert yourself. Be proud of yourself. Grab your place in the sun. But God says... You've got to admit your weakness and nothingness. And when you do, though, that's not the end. It's just the beginning of being truly blessed and happy. When you say, I can't, but God can, that's when real life begins. And that's when blessing begins to flow into your life. Being poor in spirit, secondly, involves an honest appraisal. It means to do a reality check where you come to see the truth about yourself. It means that you recognize the full impact of your sinfulness before God and you recognize how helpless and impotent you really are without Him. It means that you stop comparing yourself to others and you compare yourself only against the holiness of God and you realize how miserably sinful you really are. It happened to Isaiah, the premier prophet of the Old Testament. He felt pretty smug, self-righteous, self-confident until one day he found himself in the presence of a holy and almighty God. And that experience changed his life forever. In the presence of that holy God, he says, Oh, woe is me, I am doomed. For I am a sinful man. When Isaiah clearly saw himself as he was, it caused him to realize that he was ruined, that he needed forgiveness and cleansing. And it was at that point that God touched his life and began to use him in a remarkable way. If we are to be poor in spirit, the same thing must happen to us. We need to take an honest look at ourselves and see who we really are and what we're really all about. Not what we pretend to be, 
not what others may see in us, but we must see ourselves as we really are before holy, almighty God. And the truth is, we're helpless, powerless, sinful, bankrupt, spiritually destitute, in need of a Savior. Uh, we need to see the seriousness of our sin, the enormity and the crushing weight of our sin, the fact that it separates us from God, the fact that it condemns us before Him, the fact that it breaks the heart of God. Not just our big sins, but our little sins also. Not just our visible sins, but the hidden ones as well. All of our sins point to the fact that we've all gone astray. We've all fallen short. We all need to repent and change the direction of our life. I don't know about you this morning, but I believe that we're not good. We're not acceptable. We're not right. And when we realize that, and we're poor in spirit, we recognize that we need Jesus. Thirdly, being poor in spirit then involves utter desperation. It means that when we recognize this great weight of sin on our shoulders and in our lives, we have no place to turn but to God. It's like a drowning person going under for the last time. All your strength is exhausted. There's no fight left in you. You know that your only hope for survival is for someone to come and rescue you. Because you know that you can't save yourself. It's having the attitude of the tax collector in Jesus' parable in Luke 18. You remember the story? There was a Pharisee and a tax collector who went to the temple one day to pray. The, tax, the, the Pharisee is over in the corner standing up, so proud of himself, recounting to God all the good things in his life. And the picture shifts to the tax collector who is kneeled down, hunched over, can't even look up because of the weight of the sin that's in his heart and life. And we see that picture of that tax collector beating himself on the chest saying, simply, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Who went home right with God that day? It wasn't that self-righteous Pharisee who who declared all his religious and moral and ethical credentials to God, but rather the one that got justified was the guy who came utterly desperate and helpless before God. The one who was begging for mercy because he recognized his spiritual condition. He knew he had nothing within himself that could ever please God. You see, we get right with God only when we wake up to the fact that we are utterly depraved and in a desperate condition. And in brokenness and bankruptcy, we fall before Him as a spiritual beggar, begging for mercy and grace, knowing that if He doesn't save us, we are without hope. Fourthly, being poor in spirit then involves total reliance. It means that I turn from myself and I turn to God. I let go of my life and I let God begin to have control of mine. Jesus said in John 15 that I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Do you see the picture here? The branch clings to the vine. Because the branch is totally dependent on the vine for its very life and existence. When we are poor in spirit, we recognize that without Jesus, we can do nothing. This truth is simply but powerfully expressed in the lyrics of a song that was written by Gary Chapman. He writes, in this world of up and down, cold and hot, I don't need a little help. I need a lot. In this mystifying maze that life brings, I can break it down to one simple thing. I need Jesus. I need Jesus in my life. I don't need a bigger house, another toy, another stress distraction to enjoy. 
I only need to believe in who I am when I put myself completely in his loving hand. I need Jesus. I need Jesus in my life. Finally, being poor in spirit involves limitless satisfaction. Blessed, happy, makarios, Jesus says, are those who are poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is fantastic. This is wonderful beyond words. This isn't a wish. This is real. Theirs, mine. Yours, ours, is the kingdom of heaven. And he's not just talking about heaven over there someday, but he's talking about heaven right here and now. For when we surrender and declare spiritual bankruptcy and begin to depend on the provision of God's Son in our lives, we can be blessed with all of his kingdom blessings right now. That means we can have kingdom grace, we can have kingdom mercy, we can have kingdom love, kingdom joy, kingdom peace. We can have kingdom comfort, kingdom wisdom. Why? Because we are servants of the king of all kings. The bottom line of this beatitude and the takeaway that I want you to have from the message this morning is this. What we... When we bring what we have, which is nothing, we get what Jesus has, which is everything. Think about that again. When we bring what we have, which is nothing, we get what he has, Jesus has, which is everything. The reason we get the kingdom is because we're no longer on the throne. Jesus is. And when that happens, all of a sudden, all of heaven's blessings are open to us. The favor of God is showered on us. His full measure of blessing is poured out on us. But we've got to take the first step and say, I can't do it. I am nothing. I am nobody. And when you empty yourself of you, that's when Jesus comes to say, I've got everything, and I'll fill you up with myself. The first action we must take to experience a blessed and happy and joyful life is not to brag about anything we are, but to beg and say, Jesus, I need you. As I close, let me ask you to take your hands and turn them over like this with your palms up I want you to look at them there's nothing in your hands and that's exactly what you bring to him nothing every one of us palms up empty void zero say today Jesus I've got nothing and I am nothing and then say, Jesus, I need you. Help me. Come and fill my life with you. I want you and you alone to be in control of my life. Now I want you to take your hands and raise them up and out. And say, Jesus, I surrender today. I surrender my heart. I surrender my life. I surrender my all. Empty me of me and fill me up with you. Because Jesus, it's not about me. It's all about you. Set me on the path to a blessed and holy life as I surrender everything I am to you. Today, Lord, I need you and you alone in my life. Let's pray together. Father, in these moments, help us to realize the truth of this powerful verse of Scripture, that it is not about us, but it is all about you. You left heaven's glory 
in the form of your son, Jesus, to come to this world to show us your love, to provide your forgiveness by dying on a cross for our sins, to be raised victoriously from the grave, to prove that you do have the keys to a blessed and holy and prosperous life. Help us to remember and to recognize that it all begins when we come to you with nothing of ourselves and ask you to become everything to us. God, help us today, wherever we are in our lives, to say, Lord, I need you. I need you right now. I surrender my will, my hopes, my plans, my desires to you. As I empty me of me, fill me with you, and help me from this point forward to be poor in spirit, to be totally dependent upon your grace and love and mercy, knowing that that's the key to walking with you and the key to a blessed life. Speak to my heart. Speak to our hearts right now, Jesus, as we say, Lord, I need you. It's in his name I pray. Amen. God, we come together today to say we need you. I pray for every person that's listened to this broadcast, no matter where they are, no matter the circumstances of their life, help them to simply open themselves to you. And may you do for them what you did for Charles Colson, what you've done for me, and what you've done for countless others. 
Fill us with your presence and with your salvation. And we'll give you glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. So grateful that you are a part of this broadcast today. And as we close this service, if there is a commitment or decision that you've made for the Lord and you would like to talk to somebody about that, we hope that you will contact us here at Parkway. Uh, you can visit us on our website, parkwaybc.net. You can call our church office. Uh, you can communicate on Facebook with a comment. It'll be our pleasure to try to talk with you and help you in your walk with the Lord. As we begin to look toward a, a, a brand new week, let's dedicate this week to our great God. Let's make it count for Him and whatever opportunities He provides us with. Kids, I want to remind you that you still have this week to work on your happy surprise where you're going to surprise someone with an act of kindness. And we want you to communicate that to us, uh, send that information in to Alan so that next Sunday we can rejoice and see some of the examples of what you've done as children to make a difference in other people's lives. And then I want to invite you to be back with us Wednesday night for another telecast at 6 o'clock. Who knows where Matt Meganson is going to be this week. He's in a different part of the building uh, every week sharing God's word about how we can make it through tough times. So I'm excited to find out where he'll be. Come join us 6 o'clock on Facebook Live this Sunday evening. We want to go from this place and in our lives rejoicing in God's goodness. Our, our musicians and singers are going to lead us in this closing song. May God bless you as you serve him this week. Have a great week.